We started a new series last week called uh, Praying Beyond Your Mind. Praying Beyond Your Mind. And uh, so since today was Mother's Day, I thought it'd be appropriate we kind of tie in some things about mom. But again, everything we're talking about today, it's for everybody. It's applicable for everybody. But with moms, you know the difference between moms and dads. Uh, moms just seem to be a little bit more caring, a little bit more nurturing, a little bit more loving. Uh, you know, I don't know if your home is like our home, but you know, like if Jake, if he goes outside and he hurts himself, scratches his knee, or you know, gets a boo-boo or something, um, he can come to me and he can show me, and even if there's a little bit of blood or something, i say, well, buddy, you're okay, just go wash it off and go play. And he'll turn around and he may cry a few tears and then he'll go home. But if mama's home, he comes up to mama and shows mama. And I tell you, the waterworks start on both sides. Jake's crying. Mama's crying. Jake is up in her lap and she is holding him and caressing him. I mean, there's no blood. But you would have thought he lost his leg. I mean, they are holding each other over a scratch. And he's saying, mama, I need a Band-Aid. And she's putting on two. And I'm like, boy, you are wasting money. You don't need a Band-Aid. There's not even blood. But mama's just, there's something about a, a, a mother, that, that thing on the inside that just, oh man, you just love your children. And, and with moms and the difference between dads, you know, I mean, we see that with moms there's all these different responsibilities and, and things they take care of and, and take on. You know, moms, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if the mom is working and the dad's working, the mom usually is the one still doing the cooking, still doing the cleaning. Still doing all of the housework and dad's sitting at home watching TV or something like that. But mom's got all these responsibilities on her. And most of us understand that mom, they've got a lot of responsibilities. Uh, uh, many of the things they go are unrecognized. They're underpaid, uh, undernoticed. But they've got lots of responsibilities. But one of the responsibilities that, that moms think that they have, and we think that moms have because it's just been talked about and said in society and we've believed it to be true, one of the responsibilities that a lot of moms think they have is to worry over their children. How many of you have ever heard a mom say, I just worry over my kids? You know, that's what a mom just does. That's what a mom's to do. We, we just love our kids so much, we, just, we worry over our kids. It's just the job of a mom. Well, that may be believed and accepted out in society, but, but you're not going to find that here. Actually, what you're going to find is that in the Bible, there's over 365 times it says, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, do not fear, do not stress, do not be anxious. You find it all throughout the Bible, and yet it's accepted in society in that as a parent, uh, our job is to worry over our kids. Now, if you want to have the world's results, you keep on doing it the world's way. But if you want God's results, then you've got to do it God's way. And many times you'll find that God's way, it is the direct opposite of the world's way. So if God says, don't worry, and the world says, do worry, then you ought to be smart and say, I am not going to worry. But if you think that I'm wrong, let me show you what worrying over your family and over your kids will do for you. Anybody ever heard of a guy named Job? Poor old Job. Man, God was just so mean to Job. That's what most of the world thinks. And that's what most of the church thinks. But the reason they think that, because they didn't read their Bible. So, turn over to the book of Job. You'll find it in the Old Testament. And let's look at Job. If you can find Psalms and Proverbs, uh, you can find Job. If you find Psalms, turn one couple pages back and you'll find Job. And I want you to turn to chapter 1 of Job. And we're going to look at Job. There's some interesting things about Job, some things you don't hear people talk about about Job. All people talk about when they talk about Job is about how God was just mean to Job. But actually the Bible doesn't say that either. There's a lot of things people say that the Bible says that actually the Bible doesn't say. Uh, now grandma may have said that, grandpa may have said that. Somebody on CNN may have said that, but you're going to find that God didn't say that. So Job chapter 1, uh, look at verse 1. It says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, he was upright, and he was one who feared God and he shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. 
Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. Makes me feel better about my life. I got all these animals at home. We were looking at all the, all the chickens yesterday. We got more eggs coming out. I don't know what to do with I was like, Lacey, we, get, we need to eat eggs for dinner tonight and eggs for breakfast in the morning. We, I counted over eight dozen eggs in our fridge. Goats and donkeys, and she's wanting more alpacas. I'm like, good Lord. But then you go and read something about, about somebody like this. You feel better about yourself. In a very large household, verse 3, it says, So this man, he was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses and each uh, an appointed day. And they'd send and invite three sisters, their three sisters to eat and drink with him. And so it was when the days of feasting had run their course, Job would send and he would sanctify them and he would rise early in the morning and he would offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Sounds like Job was a really uh, smart guy, a really religious guy. Uh, it says, for Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and they curse God in their hearts. And so Job did this regularly. So the reason Job was actually uh, burning sacrifices and giving offerings unto God because he was afraid that his kids were doing something wrong. And the Bible says that Job, he did this regularly. So this was a part of his lifestyle. This is something that he did every day. He was worrying about his kids. Well, but you, you, you got to understand, Pastor Chad. I mean, that's just what a parent does. A parent worries about their kids. Uh, one that wants to get results for the kids doesn't worry. One that's actually trusting God and believing God doesn't worry about their kids. Well, but you understand, I mean, you know, if you love your kid, you worry about them. Uh, you may believe that, but, but show that to me here. Please. I'll give you $1,000. You can find that. You ain't going to find it here. Yeah, but you, if you love your kid, you worry about them. No, you don't. Now, I know that, that goes so counter culture to what our culture says. If you love them, you worry about them. No. If that was the truth, you'd find it here. But you will not find it here. But let's look and see what happens when you worry about your family and you do this all the time. When this is a lifestyle for you about worrying about people because you love them. Look at what happened here. So Job did this all the time. He did this all the time. Um, go on down to uh, verse 13. And if you, if you read the, the scriptures in between that, uh, it says that Satan went unto God, and God said, I ain't touching, this ain't my thing. He said, everything that is in his hands, it's in your hands. And the reason that Satan uh, had an open door into Job's life, God didn't do this, Satan did. The reason that Satan had an open door, because Job had opened it up by fear. He was worrying, and said so he did it regularly. And that's why God in here, he tells Satan, he said, everything that he has is in your hands. And then you see the result of this. Verse 13 says, now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabians raided them and took them away. They killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. And then while he was still speaking, another came and said, the fire fell from heaven, the fire of God. And it burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another person came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, took them away. Yes, killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people and their dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground, and he worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that stupid song is sung on the Christian radio all the time. He gives and takes away. Hey, just because somebody said it doesn't mean that God said it. Let me put it to you like this. Just, be, just because you read it in the Bible, the, the Bible truly states things, but do, just because it's truly stated doesn't mean that it's true. Or let me put it to you like this. There's things that, that the Bible tells us that Satan said, but just because Satan said it doesn't mean that it's true. 
And there's some things in here you find out about Job that Job said, but just because Job said it doesn't mean that it's true. Because when you read this, you find out that God is not the one that did this to him. The one who did all this stuff to him was Satan. God is not the author of death. He's not the author of sickness and disease. Jesus said in John 10.10, He said, the thief has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come that you would have life. So don't you believe that life in the pit of hell, that God's the one causing tornadoes and God's causing hurricanes and God's putting cancer on people and God's killing people and God's slamming cars into a tree and He's doing it because it's His perfect plan and He's wanting to teach them something. Don't believe that mess. What you need to do is you need to open up your Bible, read it, and show yourself to be smart. Because if you read on down here, if you go into chapter 2, Uh, verse 2, it says, The Lord said to Satan, where do you come from? Satan said, I've been going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. And then you go down to verse 7, it says, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and, and who struck Job? Satan struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Who's the one that made Job sick? Satan did, not God. Not God. So next time you're in a church service and the preacher says God made Satan sick, walk up and say, look, preacher, I'm smarter than you and you need to read your Bible because the Bible says Satan did that. Not God. Satan did that. But you need to remember something. What started all of this? He was worrying over his kids. Anytime you get into fear, you have automatically stepped out of faith. You've automatically stepped out of faith. And if you're not in faith, then you are in fear. Basically, you could say it like this. is fear... It's simply faith in something other than God. Fear is faith in something other than God. So if you're not trusting in God, you're trusting in somebody else. And notice Job, he was doing something that was good. He was offering sacrifices and this and that, but his motivation was wrong. There's a lot of us, we go into prayer and we do all these things that may seem good on the surface, but our reason behind it, our motivation behind it, isn't faith-based, it's fear-based. And if it's not faith-based, if it's not coming from faith, then you're not going to get the required and the intended result. Job was doing this, but he was doing it because he was afraid. And because he was afraid, and he was living in fear, then God told Satan, everything that he has, it's in your hand. See, when you start living in fear, you open up the door for Satan to run rampant in your life. But you live a life by faith, you slam that door shut, and you allow God to run rampant in your life. See, you've got the choice in what's going to go on in your life, and you've got the choice what's going to go on in your children's life uh, for a time being while they're growing up in your house. But just because you love somebody doesn't mean you worry over them. Because if you worry over them, you're opening up some doors that you're not going to want open. Now, you can, you can disagree if you want, but it's right here. So who's the one that struck uh, Job? Got him sick. Satan. See, the deal is, is that people, they worry over people. And mamas and daddies and parents, they worry over their kids. And you know what's going to happen? While you're worrying, you're worried over them, and eventually it's going to affect you too. Medical science has proven that stress and fear and anxiety, it will affect your body. It will tear you down. It will wear you down. And you're living like that. You're not not only opening up the door for the devil uh, in your family. You're opening up the door for the devil in your own life. So it's a choice. You choose fear or you choose faith. I choose faith. Because I'm going to trust in God. You mean you don't worry about your kids? You must not love them. Oh, I love them. I love my son. But I choose not to be afraid. I choose not to live a life over fear. If he's outside and and I didn't see him for a few seconds, I'm not going to get afraid all of a sudden. No, i got to make a stand. I'm going to be in faith. If if something happened to him at school and the school calls, I've got to make a decision. Am I going to get in fear? Or am am I going to stay in faith? It's a choice that I make. If I love my child, I'm not going to worry worry over him. Because I love my child, I'm going to be in faith over that child. Well, if you really love them, you worry them. No, you're not going to find it here. If you really love them, you'll believe God over them. So let me show you you something else here. So Job chapter 3. 
You know, this, this is a story about Job. People hear all about Job, just one little portion. They hear about how bad Job had it. But what they don't understand, because they don't take time to read, is that the reason these things happen is because Job opened the door himself. And then look at the end of chapter 3. It says in verse 25, Job talking here, he said, The thing that I greatly feared, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I had dreaded has happened unto me. Job 3, 25. The thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. He said, the thing that I greatly feared, and the things that I was dreading, it happened. I'm not at ease, nor am I quiet. See, the thing is, you're going to have what you say. You, don't, you may not believe it. It's fine. It's Bible. God has said it. He said, by the, by the words of your mouth, you will be filled. You're going to eat the fruit of your mouth. Uh, your words produce death. Your words produce life. Your words produce blessing. Your words produce cursing. You will have what you say. You'll have what you say. Jesus said over Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24, He said, uh, whoever believes in... And, and, or I'm sorry, I was going to quote my favorite one, John 14, 12. But he said, whoever says in this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Job, he, he just let the cat out of the back. The reason things that were happening to him are happening is because he was speaking some things. The things he was afraid about, the things he was dreading, the reason behind all of his actions, they ended up happening. Why? Because he got out of faith, he was living in fear, and he opened up the door. But if you don't like that story, you're really not going to like this next one. Because this next one involves this guy named Jesus. hate to bring Jesus into it, but you know it's church, we might as well. So Mark chapter 5, I want you to see something about Jesus and, and dealing with parents and, and, and a really uh, precarious situation in their child. Mark chapter 5, there's a story about a guy and his child. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 and verse 21. You there? 521 says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude had gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she would be healed and that she would live. So he's doing the right thing. He's going unto God here. He's going unto the Lord. He said, if you'll just pray for her, I know she'll live. Well, then this woman comes up. that have been battling this, this sickness and disease for a long time, and she comes and interrupts everything. And she was holding Jesus up. And so while she's being ministered to, uh, if you go on down to verse 35, some things are happening. And it says, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and he said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? He said, your daughter's dead. You don't need to trouble him anymore. I want you to notice Jesus' response. Look at what Jesus says. Verse 36, it says, as soon as... As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken. Now what was the word? Your daughter's dead. Don't bother him anymore. The Bible says as soon as Jesus heard those words. You know what he did? He looked at him and said, Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, what, what, are, what are we going to do? Oh, I'm so sorry. Patted him on the back. No, look what he said. It says, as soon as he heard the word, he said to him, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Oh, but if you love your children, you're worried over them. Well, we don't see that with Job, and then we certainly don't see that with Jesus, because Jesus said, don't worry. He said, do not be afraid. I love the fact, it says, as soon as Jesus heard it. Jairus didn't even have a chance to open up his mouth. He didn't have a chance to respond. Jesus, because Jesus understood the seriousness of this. If you get out of faith, ain't nothing going to happen good for you. If you get out of faith, you slam the door shut for God to move in your life. As soon as Jesus heard that, he looked at Jairus and he said, do not be afraid. 
In other words, shut your mouth, don't you say a word. He said, do not be afraid, just believe. And then they go from there and they go on a journey to the man's house. Now, you got to understand something. Uh, while they're walking, you know some things were going through Jairus' mind. Imagine if you got the news. Your child is dead. They were sick, they're dead. And you got to walk back. And Jesus, now remember, we, we look at Jesus a different way than these people were back then. They, they didn't understand everything that, that we do now. That Jesus tells them, don't, don't be afraid, just believe. Shuts his mouth up, and they're walking. You know the thoughts are coming, because you know the way the devil operates. He's bringing the thoughts. You know she's dead. You know she's dead. Ain't nothing going to happen. May as well go ahead and start planning the funeral, getting rain made. But Jesus said, don't be afraid. Just believe. In other words, didn't let him say anything. Why? Because you're going to get what you say. He said, don't be afraid, only believe. And, and they're walking on down there. They get to the house, verse 38, or verse uh, 37. It says, he permitted no one to follow except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. Now, isn't it interesting Jesus only let three guys come with him? Now, you know there were some other guys with him. We know there was at least 12. But he said, you guys stay behind. I'm only letting these three come with me. And there, there's some wonderful truth to this. Is that when you get in a situation with your kids, you get in a situation with your family, you need to get all the doubters out of your way. You need to get all the doubters out of your house. Because you've got a lot of people that will call themselves your friend. But when it comes to stuff like this, they may have good intentions, but their intentions aren't going to produce results. Because they're going to get around you and they're going to say, oh, I'm so sorry. And then you got some real religious ones that are going to try to console you and say, well, it was just part of God's perfect plan. We need, just need to trust Him. You need to slap those people. Because if you, if you keep reading about the story of Job, you see the same thing. The Bible says that Job, he had these three friends. And these three friends, when they found out about everything that happened to Job, they came together and it says they made arrangements to go and to console him and to mourn with him. What you need in situations like this, you need some faith buddies. You need some faith friends. Some people that get around you, and when they see you start to get weak, they can look at you just like Jesus and say, don't you be afraid. You just believe. You keep your faith in God. You keep your faith in God. And I like about Jesus, you know, this isn't the Jesus we hear about. We just hear about a Jesus today that just loved everybody. Didn't want to offend everybody. Not this Jesus. Jesus said, I know you guys are with me, but y'all stay here. Because these guys that I got with me, there's some faith guys. He didn't let anybody go with him except for Peter, James, and John. And so they get to the house. And I like this. So they get to the house. And they saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. Verse 39 says, Jesus came in. He looked at them. And he said, why are you making all this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but is simply asleep. Verse 40, it says, they ridiculed him. See, this is the Jesus that we honor and we worship. And serve. But these people, they didn't understand. They didn't see him the way that you and I see him now. It says they ridiculed him. They made fun of him for saying what he said. They ridiculed him. That's why a lot of people ridicule you. When things are going on in your life, and you turn around and you, st you say what the Bible says, people will make fun of you. They'll ridicule you. They'll criticize you. Why? Because they're living according to senses. They're living according to what their mind is telling them. Not living according to what their spirit's telling them. Not living according to what the Word of God is telling them. If you want to get results, you've got to live by the Word. It's just that simple. It says they ridiculed Him. You know what Jesus did? It says they ridiculed Him. And you know what Jesus did? He put Him outside. This ain't even His house. This ain't Jesus' house. He went inside. They're making fun of him, doing all this. He said, get out. Where is this Jesus we don't hear about today? He said, get out. Why? Because if you want results, if you're going to live a life by faith, you're going to find out sometimes it's a lonely life. You don't have to have lots of people around you all the time. 
Because you're going to find that a lot of those people that are around you all the time, they are going to hold you down, they're going to hold you back, and they're going to get you results that only the devil will get you. See, Jesus wasn't afraid to be alone. Jesus wasn't afraid to not be so popular. Because Jesus was only concerned about results. And that's all I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about results. See, I could give you a cutesy little, you know, Mother's Day message today, and you could go out and have little goosebumps and, and hair stand on your neck, and, and then, oh, wasn't that so nice, and, and be all emotional and everything. Or we can give you something that actually produces results for your life every day. This will produce results for you. Jesus got everybody out. And I guarantee you, at some point in our life, we are all going to be faced with some type of situation where some type of calamity has, has happened or is trying to happen. Some type of disaster is trying to happen in our life. And this right here is a perfect example of how you need to act. You don't need to worry about it because you love them. You need to be in faith about it because you love them. You got to love me at church. Then you can go out and hate me or whatever. But Jesus got them all out. And then notice, it says he took the father and the mother of the child... And those who were with him, the ones that were with him, was Peter, James, and John. And he entered where the child was lying. So you know grandmama was there and grandpa was there and he got them out too. Got auntie and uncle out. He got all of them out. Only let uh, five people come in there with him. He entered where the child was lying. He took the child by the hand, verse 41. And he said, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and she walked. She was 12 years of age and they were overcome with great amazement. Overcome with great amazement. So Jesus wanted results. He was planning on getting results. But the only reason he got results is he was able to keep Jairus, who was the father of this child, he was able to keep him in faith. See, it's always God's will for these things to happen. It's always God's will uh, for the blessings of God to take place in your life, the promises of God to take place in your life. But just because it's God's will doesn't mean it's going to happen. If it's going to happen, it's because you hooked your faith up to God's plan and you received it. See, it's God's will for everybody to be saved. But just because it's God's will for everybody to be saved doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved. Why? Because they got to make a choice to believe. And when you make a choice to believe, you put yourself in a position to be able to receive. But as long as you are worrying, you you are shutting the door to God to be able to do anything in your life. So don't buy into the lie that if you love your kids, you worry over them, that that's your job, that's your responsibility. Your job and responsibility is not to worry over your kids. Because if you're worrying over your kids, then what you are really saying is that you are God. Jesus didn't say, well, Jairus, just worry. No, he said, shut your mouth, don't be afraid, just believe. And then he got everybody else out. Just faith people. Just people that were believing. Why? Because it was a life or death situation. So your job is not to worry over your kids, parent. Your job is to be in faith about them. Your job is to speak words of life over them. Because you're going to get what you say. So let me show you some things that you need to be praying over your kids. So you can worry over kids. Or you can pray the promises. You don't need to pray the problem. You need to pray the promises of God over their little lives. But a lot of people are praying the problem. They're talking about the problem. They're calling their friend and talking about the problem. Well, you wouldn't understand what little Johnny did. I mean, he's off and and now he's into drugs and alcohol. And 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 this one, you know, they, they ran off from home and they're living like the devil. And I just don't know what to do. I stay up all night worrying about them. And I go to bed and just crying about them. I mean, I'm just stressed out. My face is breaking out. My blood pressure is high. But I can't help it. I mean, it's my kid. I love him. I just worry about him. What you're saying is, I don't trust God. Oh, that, 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 that's harsh. It's the truth. If you're worrying, it's because you don't trust God. So you need to pray the promises of God. See, this stuff ain't popular. It ain't popular at all. You know why? Because it puts responsibility on your shoulders. Because everybody wants to put it off on God. But let me tell you something. God can't do whatever He wants to do. Chew on that one. 
Just because he's God doesn't mean he can do what he wants to do in your life. Why? Because he gave you and I a free will. He gave you and I a free will. He gave us free choice. We can choose whatever we want. You can choose to go to heaven if you want. You can choose to die and go to hell if you want. It's your choice. But God, the Bible says that God's will is for every man to be saved. But just because it's his will for every man to be saved doesn't mean every man's going to be saved because every man has a free choice. And that same principle, that same truth applies to every other area of your life. So let me show you some things you need to be praying over your kids. First one's over here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. This is something I pray over myself, I pray over my family, I pray over you guys, I pray over our church. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, this is what Paul prayed over the church, and he prayed this all the time. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, he said, Therefore, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, and I make mention of you in my prayers. And this is what he was praying here. He said, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, would give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. So basically what Paul is praying He's praying that their eyes would be open and that they would see, that they would understand, that they would be aware of some things. And then he's going to list three things. He's praying that we would begin to see and understand. He said, number one, that you would know what is the hope of your calling. In other words, that you and I would know what the plan of God is for our life. See, even as little kids, you need to be praying over them. God, I, I just ask that you would open up their eyes that they would know the plan of God for their life. Even as a small child, that they would know. You see, the more their eyes begin to get open, the more revelation they get as to what God has called them to do. When they get into to be a teenager, they don't got to be a rebellious teenager. They can be a righteous teenager. See, we, we buy into all this stuff, you know. Well, I've got a two-year-old, and you know what goes on in the twos. It's those terrible twos. Man, he's just rotten right now. Well, you're going to have what you say. We didn't go through terrible twos. Jake was great. We didn't claim terrible twos. We claimed terrific twos. And I'm not claiming a, you know, a rebellious teenager. Don't buy that stuff. People say, well, you know, they're just teenagers. You know, that's what they do. No, they don't have to be that way. That's what the world says, but not in God's house. Not God's people. Not faith people. Your children don't have to be rebellious. They can be good all the time, all through their household. They can be respectful. They can be obedient. They can be honorable. They can be reverential. I mean, you can have good kids. But it all starts about what you're saying over them, what you're praying over them. You can start right now. Pray, God, open their eyes that they would know what your plan is for them. That way they don't get to be like some of us and 40, 50 years old still trying to figure out what God wants us to do. How about if they found out at age 10? What if they found out at age 7? 13. He said, I pray that you would know what God's plan is for your life. Number two, he said, I pray that they would understand what the inheritance of the saints are. In other words, I'm praying that you would understand you've got an inheritance. In other words, you've got a rich daddy. You've got a rich daddy. See, if you can teach your children while they're growing up that you are not their source, that God is their source, that the bank isn't their source, that the government is their source, but God is their source. You teach them to tithe and to give and to sow seed and to be led by the Holy Ghost in their giving. I'm telling you, when they get 19, 20, 20 years old and get into college and they know the plan of God for their life and they've learned how to sow and how to reap and how to trust God, they won't come out of college being full of debt. They won't go into marriage being full of debt. They won't have to be like a lot of people when they get married, struggling along, eating peanut butter and jelly for 10 years just so they can afford to have a, a ham sandwich. See, you won't have to be worrying over your kids that they're going to be financially stable. You can start praying out some things even while they're young because you love them. You don't worry over them. You pray. You believe God and you pray these things over them. 
pray that, that they would understand the, the call of God on their life, the plan of God for their life, that they have an inheritance. There's some things that God has, has provided for them and put up for them. And he said, number three, pray that you would understand the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His mighty power that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. So all that boil it down to this, that you would understand, your child would understand the authority that they have as a believer. So when the devil tries to come against them because he is the adversary, he is the evil one, he is the enemy, and he is going to come against your kids. But when he does come against them, your children know who they are. They know who they are in Christ, and they know that they are not the devil's slave, that they are the devil's master, and the devil is under their feet. Sickness and disease is under their feet. Uh, terrorism and danger is under their feet, that if they're in school and all of a sudden somebody comes in there with a gun, they don't have to be afraid like everybody else. They can point at that dude with a gun and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, devil, I command you to loose that thing and let it go. But what happens is, our kids, they get afraid. And, and, and everything that's going on in TV and media, I mean, it's just putting fear and putting fear and putting fear. And it's all anti-God, getting God out of the way. So you trust in the system. You trust in the government. You trust in yourself. You trust in all these people and all these situations and all these organizations except for trusting in God. But as a parent, we've got a responsibility not to worry over them, but to believe God, to pray over them and put these things into them. And one of the major ways that we do that is we pray. We trust God. We put it in God's hand and we pray. God, open their eyes that they would see what your plan is. That they would see the inheritance that you have for them. And they would see the authority that they have because they are one with you. That no matter what the enemy tries to bring against them, it's no match for them. Well, if they know that whatever the devil brings is no match for them, and whatever the devil brings, they're always going to have the victory in Christ Jesus, that they're more than a conqueror through Christ, that God always leads them in triumph in Christ. It doesn't matter what comes their way, they're going to always overcome. And therefore, they will always be safe. They will always be sound. They will always be untouched and unharmed. Why? Because their eyes have been opened and they know who they are, they know what they have, they know what God has called them to do. But if you don't like that one, then look over at Philippians. Real quick. Philippians. One, a couple pages over. Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 1 and verse 9. This is another prayer that Paul prayed for the church. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9. So these are things you ought to be praying over yourself, praying over your family, and praying over your kids. Not praying according to your mind. Praying according to the promises. Pray according to what the Bible says. Philippians 1 verse 9 says, This I pray. I pray that your love would abound more and more. And check this out. You see a theme here. More and more in knowledge and in discernment. In other words, again, that, that they would grow in an awareness and understanding of the things of God and that they would make the right decisions at the right time. They would discern right and wrong. They would, they would discern what is truth and what is false. That they would understand some things. That their eyes would be open to some things. And he said that they would approve the things that are excellent. Again, so that our children, we pray that they would make the right decisions. The right times. They would learn to be led by the Holy Ghost. And he said that you would be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness. With the fruits of righteousness. So, so you, you see this, Paul's praying that, that our eyes would be open. We would know God's call. We would know our inheritance. Our, we would know our position and our authority. That we would grow in the love of God. We'd make the right decisions at the right time. There's a little confession that Lacey and I, we've made over Jake since he was a little bitty baby. And he's seven and a half years old right now. And we say it every single day, at least once, sometimes twice. And uh, on our way to school, it, it's a part of, we, we pray over him in the mornings while we're driving, and this is a part of what we say with him, and he knows it by heart. He could tell it to you right now, verbatim, and, and this is what we, we, we declare over him um, in the morning and at night, and it's this, I'm quick, I'm sharp, I'm smart, I'm good looking. 
He's a good-looking kid. He's got a good-looking mama and a good-looking daddy. Quick, sharp, smart, good-looking, very rich, a major blessing. I know the voice of God. Mighty miracles happen through my hands. I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord and with man. I have the Spirit of God. I know the voice of God. I'm always in the right place at the right time. I always say the right thing at the right time. I have the joy. And then Jake added these. I've got the joy of God. I've got the fun of God. We, we've said that every day for seven and a half years. He's quick, sharp, smart, good looking, very rich, a major blessing. He knows the voice of God. Mighty miracles. Why? Because I, I understood this uh, from, from, from the beginning. If I can teach my child to know the voice of God, he's got it made. I learned that several years ago with me. I found out if I can hear the voice of God, I've got it made in life. I can't be beaten. I can't be defeated. Nobody can overcome me. I cannot fail because I know the voice of God. And this is one of the things he's praying over the church. This is one of the things we ought to be praying for our kids. You speak words of life. And I can say this. I'm a little partial. He, he's, he's our son. We say he's quick, sharp, smart. We encourage him. We love him. We declare these things over him. He's like way ahead of the kids in his class. I mean, it was only a couple months in, in the, he's in first grade, a couple months in the first grade, and his teacher said, really, he's, he's doing second grade stuff. And she's having to kind of, she's using him to teach the kids in the class. I'm like, we're going to get a cut in this pay here? I mean, you know. But she partners him up with the kids who, who are doing, doing kind of bad and, and kind of learning kind of slow, and she, she uses him to help the other kids. And I told him, but remember, Jake, this is what we said. You're quick, sharp, smart. Even Daniel, you think this is crazy, but even Daniel, read about the story of Daniel, and Daniel said this about himself. He declared it. He said, I'm ten times smarter than everyone around me. And the Bible says it played out. And the king said it about them. He was ten times smarter than all of the professionals, all of the experts that were all around him. And because of that, he raised him up and put him in a position of high authority and leadership. High authority and leadership. Well, why are we praying these things? Because I'm not setting myself up to worry over my child. I'm setting him up to be in a position of success so that I don't have to be in a position to worry about him. Now, there's going to be some times, there's going to be some situations that's going to arise. You may not know what to pray. You may not know how to pray. Well, Romans 8, uh, chapter 8 and verse 26, it says that the Holy Spirit, He will help you and I when we pray. To pray about things that we don't know how to pray about. And that's why we've got to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He said he'll help you to pray about things that you don't know how to pray about. He said we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that can't be uttered. And this is what ties into last week. We were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. And that there's going to be some situations you don't know how to pray about but the Holy Spirit, He will hook up with you. And if you go to verse 27 and 28. Verse 27 says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In verse 28, many of you have heard this, and he said, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. So that's not a scripture that you use when bad things happen to justify why a bad thing happened. That is talking about prayer. You hear this in funerals a lot. Well, this bad thing happened, but you know God, He just works all these things together to, for our good. That is not what Scripture says. <laughs> Again, I don't care what society says. This is talking about prayer. That what God is going to do is, when you don't know how to pray about a situation, something comes up, maybe kind of like a Jairus situation. You don't know how to pray about it. You hook up with the Holy Ghost, and you begin to speak in other tongues about it. You pray in tongues about it. And he'll use all of this together and he's going to turn it out for your good. Why? Because when you're praying like that, you are praying out the perfect will of God. And when you pray the will of God, the Bible says in 1 John that God hears you and you will have the, the petitions and, and the desires of your heart that you have prayed for. When, God, when you pray the will of God, God hears you and you will have it. You say, but how do I do that if I don't know what to pray? I don't know what the will of God is. 
that is one of the beautiful benefits of, of praying in other talks. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. Look there real quick and then we'll close. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. We've been spending some time on this the last few weeks. I want to make sure and throw this in for you because I know there's a lot of new people here today. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, he said, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but he speaks unto God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he is speaking out mysteries. The literal Greek, and you can read this if you've got an amplified uh, Bible, amplified translation. It says, uh, not only speaks out mysteries, it says he speaks out the secret things, the deep things, the hidden things of God. So see, God always knows what you need to do. He always knows where the right place is and what, what the right time is. He always knows exactly what you need to say. Now, you may not know it here in your brain, but because you are a believer hooked up to Him, filled with the Holy Ghost, you can go past what your finite little understanding knows, and you can tap into what God knows. But remember, I said God can't just do anything because He wants to. You have to give Him access. And there's some things that's going to only happen in your life because you prayed them out. And the way you can pray these things out that even you don't know how to pray about is you hook up with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Acts 2 that when they began to speak in other tongues that the Holy Spirit gave them the words. He gave them the utterance. And so the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that He knows the things of God, the deep things of God, the secrets of God, and He will tell you what to pray. And you pray that out. Now, the Bible says you're not going to understand it. Uh, no man understands it. Even your mind doesn't understand it. Paul said, my mind is unfruitful. I think it's verse 14 or something like that. But he said, when I pray in the Spirit, my mind is unfruitful. Don't understand it. But that's okay. Because the Bible's telling you that when you begin to pray in the Spirit, you're praying out the perfect will of God. And when you pray out the perfect will of God, you will get the results that you need. And the will of God, the promise of God, they will take place in your life. So what should we be praying over our kids? We are not worrying. Don't do that worrying stuff anymore. Say, I refuse to worry. Come on, there's going to be some situations that come up. You're going to want to worry. But what you need to do is you need to grit your teeth. If you got a tear coming out of your eye, you tell that thing to get back in there. <laughs> Say, I refuse to fear. I refuse to worry. I refuse to cry. I'm not going to get upset about this. I choose to believe God. And the Word of God says whatever it is about my situation. And if you're in that situation, you don't know what the Word of God says, you need to open up your Bible, find out what the Word of God says, and you pray these things. You pray these things. You pray those things out and let God get on in the situation. During the day, during the week, pray. God, I pray for my children. That you would open up their eyes, that they would know your plan. They would know your inheritance. They would know who they are in Christ and the authority that they have as a believer. You do those three things, you pray those three things right there, I'm telling you, you are setting them up to be unstoppable in life. Absolutely unstoppable. We all want our kids to be successful. That's how you make your kids successful. Yes, we do the material things, the physical things, but don't neglect the, the spiritual things because the spiritual things are going to be what's going to affect the material things. 